Good afternoon. I, th I, I welcome all of you, especially on this snowy day um, when the City of Providence called parking bans, so it complicated, I'm sure, the arrival for a, a number of you. So thank you for those of you who ventured out today. Um, for students, there's no excuse. You're on campus, and, and we're glad to see you here. <laughs> um, my name is Sue Eckert. I'm a senior fellow here at the Watson Institute of um, International Studies. And I'm very, very pleased to introduce our speaker today. This is part of the security um, seminar series here at the Watson Institute. As many of you know, we have the, the three organizing themes of governance, development, and security. Um, this is the first public um, lecture that we've had on Russia in some time. Um, last week, we had a faculty forum with our board member, Professor Bob Lakebold and provided a lot of food for thought, which we're um, interested in continuing this discussion today. But let me say how pleased we are to introduce Brigadier General uh, Peter Zwack. He was born in Chicago, went to Trinity High School in New York, and received a BA in Political Science and History from the University of Denver. He holds a Master's in Strategic Intelligence from the Defense Intelligence Agency College another master's from the Naval War College, of which we welcome our colleagues, a number of them from the Naval War College today. Um, and he has the, a certificate of the U.S. Army Russian Institute. He enlisted in the Army a number of years ago um, and later received his commission from Officer, Officer Candidate School at Fort Benning in March of 1981. Um, we're particularly happy to have General Zwack here today because at the Watson Institute, one of the things we want to do is talk about issues from the perspective of what's going on in the real world. And the practical experience that he brings to these issues is enormous. He has served in many capacities in Europe, um, South Korea, as an intelligence liaison, part of DIA's collection coordination facility, before entering Army Foreign Area Officer Program for Russian three years, and, and I underscore to you undergraduates who sometimes complain about the, um, the language requirement, three years of intensive Russian studies um, ensued at the Defense Language Institute in Monterey and the Russian Institute in Garmisch, where in 1989, the Glasnost period, he traveled to the Soviet Union for intensive um, summer language immersion. After attending the Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth, he served as the Joint Staff at the Pentagon, working initiatives linked to NATO's Partnership for Peace, the accession of Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic into the NATO alliance. Um, upon his departure, General Zwack was recognized with the Will Admiral William Crow Award as the Joint Staff's <laughs> Action Officer for the Year in 1999. He attended in 2002 and 2003 the Naval War College in Newport. He deployed to Kosovo as part of NATO's um, K-4 force, a notable period due, uh, due to the, pro the widespread riots. Um, following the complex uh, Balkans, uh, he returned to Germany where he was a senior intelligence officer um, and deployed to Afghanistan where he was director of Joint Intelligence and Operations Center. In 2010, uh, Brigadier General Zwack returned to Washington after having been uh, 16 years total overseas and was appointed Director of Military Support and the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, followed by <laughs> service as Director of Operations for the newly established Army Cy Cyber Command at Fort, Belvedar, Fort Belvoir, um, Virginia. As you can see, and I shortened this, um, his, his, and it was very difficult because the range of his experience is, is quite impressive. From 2012 to 2014, he represented the U.S. Defense Department and the military as a senior defense attache to the Russian Federation in Moscow. His awards and decorations include the Bronze Star, Legion of Merit, the Afghan uh, Afghanistan, Kosovo, Korea, and NATO medals, the Ranger Tab, Paratrooper Badge, and many others. So as you can see, we have a very distinguished um, gentleman before us today. He's married, and in fact, his eldest daughter, Brogan, is here as a student at Brown University, and his son, Peter, happens to be on spring break and is visiting Brown as well. We are really delighted, Peter, to, um, General Zwack, to have your expertise to talk today about U.S.-Russian relations and the end of the reset, and look forward to a very lively discussion. Thank you. First of all, it's a real honor uh, to uh, be asked to uh, speak to you. Um, I've already seen that there is an awful lot of ex expertise 
uh, in the room. How many of you here, just a show of hands, um, have spent um, time in Russia or the Soviet Union? Okay, all right. And, um, um, and, and that's important. And um, uh, are there any uh, native Russians, if you will? Um, Okay, great. Um, no, it's always important to kind of know your crowd a little bit. And um, first of all, um, this is a time where, um, and I'm looking at the young folks now, um, we need to grow our Russian, what we would call deck. We need to um, grow our Russian expertise. And I don't mean go to war stuff, but we need to develop a deeper and more nuanced understanding of the drivers um, of the Russians, both, both real ones and perceived ones, and if you will, contrived ones. Um, because uh, uh, it, we're, we're, I would submit, in a pretty complicated space right now uh, that is drifting into potentially quite dangerous. Um, First of all, yes, we're going to talk about Russia and my experience uh, during the period of the, uh, basically the death of the reset. Um, but I first want to say for those of you that are Russian hands um, and, for, and, for, uh, and for those that are, are new at it, um, the, uh, the, uh, the, ex the gangland execution of Boris Boris Nemtsov was, uh, even for the Russians, over the top, beyond the pale. And it makes people think of, of uh, Sergei Kirov in 1934. Um, uh, of course, the Russian, uh, the Russian uh, press and, and um, the speculation is everywhere rife, um, except the fact that the government was possibly involved in it. Um, and, and this is, uh, this is um, um, really, really, it's, uh, this would be like gunning down one of our top politicians in the United States. Um, and, though, and though there are uh, protests and all of that, it seems that the Russians will be able to um, manage the message and the disinformation and uh, get through it. Um, this was really craven, uh, whatever the uh, facts were uh, from my perspective. Um, my two years, and well, it's interesting, Brown, um, <laughs> I have a little history of Brown. Um, I, I did study in 1989 um, um, with a, br a Brown and University of Rochester sponsored student group uh, in uh, Kalinin at the time. It became Tver. And um, it was an incredible program for that time. And it just, I'd been, I'm an old coal warrior. I mean, I, I've been in the Army since 1980. And basically, the first 10 years, unless it was South Korea, we were preparing to stop the Russians, the Soviets, and the Fulda Gap, and, and all that went with it. Um, I, I like to tell youth that um, I was, uh, my first assignment was a young, as a young second lieutenant, was um, the intelligence officer and security officer of a nuclear capable M109, which is a self-propelled artillery unit, cannons. Um, and we were to fly to Germany in a crisis, fall in on the emplaced cannons that were over there, and then be ready, if need be, receive nuclear rounds to stop the uh, so-called red hordes pouring in through the Folder Gap and the Meinigan Gap. And, and we did it, and we were serious about it, and that was the environment. But when you stand back and look at that, and you're contemplating firing a nuclear holy hand grenade 15 to 18 kilometers on West German soil, how nuts was that period when you really, really think about it? How nuts was that period? We took it very seriously. That was our reality of the time. We never, ever want to go back to that type of uh, uh, brinksmanship, if you will, that type of uh, confrontational preparation. 
I, so I tell youth especially, uh, um, go watch Dr. Strangelove. <laughs> because what is the, what is the essence of, of good satire? A modicum of truth. And, and, and as mad and zany as the world, as the movie is, there were truisms. Mutual, it was all about mutually assured destruction. And uh, I, I, I scare kids with, uh, with this. Okay? I would submit that the whole <coughs> world dodged a big bullet, uh, in the, uh, especially in the 70s and 80s. And, um, um, and we don't want to ever go back to that. So when we start hearing the talk about nuclear weapons, you know, and it's more of an innuendo, a suggestion of, you know, Vladimir Kislyak saying, you know, well, you know, we can turn American cities into ashes. It's unhelpful. Um, and it is, it is uh, meant to uh, intimidate us, intimidate our NATO allies, um, and uh, we don't want to go that way. So I would submit that, we, and so we were very, very lucky to get through that period, and then 89, you all know the story, you know, uh, the, the, you know the wall falls, and, and in 91, the Soviet Union implodes. We were so lucky to get, you know, Gorbachev at the time, um, a, a Russian patriot um, the, who, who was reviled uh, in the 90s, especially after things started not, things did not go well. Uh, but he has, he has actually recently said some pretty tough things about, about what's going on in Ukraine that are more, if you will, the classical <laughs> Russian line. So there is, there is a lot of, 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 there is a lot of stuff going on, a lot of nuance, and um, um, we really, really have to uh, uh, be careful. I would submit that we collectively are in the long game. We are in a long game with Russia. And what I mean by that is that um, basically um, we, we, we must be firm. We must absolutely support our allies. Um, and this is very, very difficult in the, geo, the geopolitics of Eastern Europe. You have to support your Article 5 allies. Um, um, or else it'll be utter chaos, I would submit, in the way things are going right now. Um, the, uh, so, the, when I arrived in 2012, Reset had been going on since 2009, there were some pretty positive things going on with the Russian military, I have to tell you. I got the, my impression, my instinct, on, and I met a lot of Russian military and a lot of veterans. While they certainly didn't agree with us on everything um, <laughs> and could get pretty, you know, argumentative, they were looking for a way to us, to the West. I don't want to overstate it, meaning they don't want to fight us and they don't want to go to war for, uh, 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 they don't want to go to war. Now, we're the gold standard. We'll be the ones that they prepare for. Because all militaries do contingency planning, okay? But um, uh, there was a lot going on. Every year you had a work plan, 60, 70, 80 events between our militaries. Um, and there were some real confidence-building things moving into the combating terrorism realm, um, you know, while itchy nonproliferation, and talking about future threats, generational challenges for both our countries. And I would submit, in this aspect, we have more, uh, more in common with the Russian Federation than not looking out the next generation. The problem is we need to get through the next decade uh, without a blowout. And, um, and, and I worry because um, I feel that our foreign policy uh, is as increasingly um, a foreign, a mutual, both sides, are, is a foreign policy of talking points. Um, press conferences, very little substantive uh, discussions, except in a few scenes, like, like uh, arms control, which is still on, which is still, and you had Rose Goddard Miller here, which is still on, which there's still a pulse in it, but much denuded. 
Uh, though we've lost cooperative threat reduction, one of the great programs of the, of the last two decades, um, and the CFE is, is pretty well been uh, neutered. Um, the whole arms control regimen, besides being important as far as managing and reducing numbers of nuclear and other weapons, was also a confidence building measure. You had senior diplomats across multiple, multiple um, uh, levels in our governments going face to face, arguing, disagreeing, but they had relationships and they talked. I, we are talking less to the Russians now, except in sort of a big political way, um, than we did in the heart of the Cold War, I would submit. And certainly, we're not talking much with the Russian military and they're not talking much with us, which I submit uh, is potentially dangerous. Um, because when you have airplanes and ships and submarines flying all over and sailing all over the place, everybody is anxious, everybody is testy, you have, all, you have a real potential for an accident, an incident, or something contrived. And now you're in a situation where the, the leaders don't know each other very well, trying to talk both sides off of the ledge. So we need to find a way, in my opinion, to, while not cutting Russia any slack on their trans gross transgression in eastern Ukraine and the illegal um, annexation of Crimea, um, we need to find a way to uh, get uh, back into some frank uh, dialogues where you may have that, and, and I'm, if I may speak for the Russians, and I have, there are some Russians here, so please correct me. They're personal. They don't want a 30-minute discussion that's businesslike and done. They, want, they believe in relationships. I don't want to overstate that, but, but we don't have that. And, and um, um, so I think we, we need to be paying attention uh, to that. Um, I'm going to talk about a number of points. And, um, um, I, I, I just will throw these out as perceptions. Uh, what I'm saying is not necessarily right. I'm trying to, rather than give you dates and data, I'm trying to give you impressions from being over there. And by the way, since 1989, I, I've, I've, I've been in Russia many times and traveled all over the country to include much time as a tourist. Um, and so, um, and while I don't, I'll never understand the Russians because I'm not a Russian and I'll never be in their skin. I, I certainly try to. I will say today that looking at the Russian Federation and the Putin regime, I don't call it a government. It's not worthy of a government. It is a regime. It's a cabal. Um, Karen Darwisha is right. It's a kleptocracy. It's a pseudo-democratic kleptocracy. You, you're reading all the books um, uh, with a false legitimacy. Um, and the Russians, I would submit, are beginning to boil in their own oil. Ever since, uh, ever since uh, Air Malaysia being shot down, the narrative has not been as positive. Uh, they had a great run. Um, um, well, they survived Bolotnaya, which was a real wake-up call for Putin. Um, and then um, um, they had a, uh, they had a, uh, a great Sochi. And I can't tell you, being in Moscow, how much the Russians were offended with the way the world was teasing them about their preparations from Sochi. We don't, we don't do a good job messaging. We have a lot of hothead mouths on our side, too. And they are a prideful bunch. And there is a kind of a Russian honor code, too. And I would submit that the Russians, um, in regard to the way we treat them, NATO um, and others, feel that they always get the short end of the stick when they're dealing with us. I, I don't necessarily agree, but um, um, and so so they've got a colossal national chip in their shoulder. I would submit uh, they have an angry foreign policy. It's almost a petulant uh, foreign policy, based on resentment. Uh, the agate prop, the the uh, disinformation in the in the hinterland is mind-boggling. 
and I would go out and travel in Russia every chance I could. And then I'd get into a hotel, and I would get on and just watch Canal 1 and Canal 24. And I'd just watch it. And, in my, and, and during the Ukrainian, the beginning of the Ukrainian crisis, my jaw, I, I mean, I'm not naive, but I can't believe they're saying this. Because the imagery, every, going on for eight hours, ten hours at a time, the imagery was ethnic Russian mothers and babies being blown up and refugees. And, and if I'm a coal miner, you know, in, in, in uh, the Urals, after six weeks of this, I'm, I'm ready to drop my jackhammer, grab a Kalashnikov and volunteer. Now, it's, it, a lot of it is sheer BS, but, but it is uh, the state control um, of the media, especially television, which is still the primary means of information, especially outside of the big cities, um, is, is, um, is extraordinary. It is almost Goebbelsian, Goebbels type. And, and, uh, so, but I will tell you that status quo right now, meaning Russia's kind of, they're sort of having their way recently, their proxies, excuse me, in eastern Ukraine, but I would submit that they're actually fairly bogged down. Um, it's, 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 it's been bloody, it's been unpopular increasingly, and while these got, you know, so-called 85 percent, uh, there, is, there is some concern in the, in, the, in the heartland, the Russian heartland, and you've all read about that. No, but, but right now, still, uh, Putin has uh, um, powerful support, uh, but I would submit that 85 percent we read about is brittle. Um, I, I just remember, you know, we talk about the Soviets. Anybody over 45 um, remembered the end of the Soviet Union, and a big piece of it was about e economics. And um, this, this, this was a black swan. They had two. They had two black swans in the last half year. One was Air Malaysia, which they somehow wiggled out of, and, and now the, uh, the, uh, the collapse of the ruble, uh, oil price, uh, inflation. Um, uh, so this is this is a real, real mess for them, and um, um, I submit it will be hard for them to turn this ship. Um, I worry that it will make them more desperate, and we'll look for ways to to change the narrative, change the dialogue, uh, create adventures. Um, and um, ergo, I think this is actually a pretty dangerous period um, because as this group feels that their, their legitimacy is starting to erode, which is built in part on a house of lies, um, that could be, that, 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 is, uh, that is an existential threat to um, uh, Putin and his cabal. So um, a status quo is not good for the Russian Federation. Um, um, and with that, I maintain that we need to play the long game. We want to try to bring them out of the wilderness. We don't want Russia to fail. We don't want Russia to cataclysmically crash. I'd be, I would submit that would be really, really dangerous. But how, how can you kind of steer it to where they start beginning to respect international norms again? Um, uh, instead of, you know, having your two Minsks and, and you know, the, 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 the ink is signed in Minsk II last month and the, the offensive continues into Debolsa, you know, and, 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 and our politicians, our president, are probably at wit's end in dealing with Putin and, and the seniors um, because they're getting lied to. It's really hard. When you're, when you're a senior military officer and you're trying to build a relationship with the Russians, and it's a telephonic, and uh, during Ukraine and all that early on in Crimea, and you're told by your counterpart, we're not in Crimea. And, and our senior, our guy will say, I can't believe he lied to me. And what's worse, he knows that I know that he lied to me. Our guy wasn't the target. The, the message is first and foremost, I would submit inside the Russian hinterland and Europe. So it's, it's, um, it's, it's challenge. It, it, it's just, 
I would submit now it is more dangerous not to talk to the Russians than to talk to them. Um, and and uh, there will be those that say if you talk to the Russians that it's appeasement um, and, and, um, uh, and all of that. I, I, I view it as just flat out good foreign policy. Again, I talked about it earlier. We need to build relationships. Uh, and I'm not sure that all the Russians that are in, in this game, if you will, are comfortable with the way things are going for Russia. It's very triumphant. The news is good and, and all of that, but not really. But, but the smart ones, I would submit, are kind of worried, though they won't say it publicly. Um, and now you, know, now you have this Nemtsov thing. And, um, um, and they'll blame it on Western or us or somebody, or and you heard that, they, that he was a, a sacrificial lamb by the left to create, you know. So we're just going to have to see what happens. But I want to go back to the original point, which I think is strategic. We don't want the Russian Federation to fail, catastrophically fail. It won't be good for them, and it certainly won't be good for the world. All right, so how do, how do we get out of this very, very difficult situation we're in? Um, as I said, the popular 85% support, in my mind, is brittle. And uh, what was mind-boggling being there was seeing how the Russian youth were drinking the Kool-Aid. I'm, I'm generalizing, of course. But I mean, smart young people were all in on Crimea um, and, and mostly in eastern Ukraine. And um, I think, in part, everybody wants to be part of a winner. And Putin, in their view, is a winner. I think there's some my country right or wrong stuff going on. Um, and the nationalisms that we talk about, I submit, have morphed, have mutated. Uh, by the way, I think that when people talk about states' relations evolving, uh, our relation with Russia, much of the West's relation has mutated. It's a mutation that's going on right now. This is not normal. Um, the, um, there was, uh, at Sochi, um, there was kind of a, the nationalism in, in, in Crimea was kind of a tailgate nationalism. We're number one. Yeah, let's go. We're, we, we're, we, we're, you go, Russia. We've won. Um, I remember on May 9th, Victory in Europe Day, uh, being up by Moscow University up in the hills outside, just driving around at midnight. And there was a gigantic tailgate party before the big parade um, um, of, of, of Russian youth just, just, just going down, 100, 150 cars. You know, honking horns, Russian flags, a few Crimean flags, things like that. And it was that kind of, that, that type of nationalism. Um, and that, and I, think it, 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 I think it continues in East Ukraine somewhat and starts to get so more sober uh, with the shoot down of Air Malaysia. And despite the conspiracy theory, theory while most probably believe it, there are some that were really, really uncomfortable. With it, I was on a I was on a Russian train um, between uh, Ekaterinburg and um, Kazan, uh, which is really fat. if you can get out to Kazan and Ekaterinburg and Europe, these are these are these are really interesting heartland places. And um, there was some there was some we we got on uh, we got on um, um, on the shoot down and but. but but you know, there were Ukrainian fighters there, you know? I mean, so, and there weren't, trust me. Um, but the, the other discussion I had, and it was a great, I was in a couchette in the train compartment. I was there with a plumber from Tatarstan, smart guy actually, but heartland, you know, um, Asian features. Um, I, uh, a, a uh, surveyor from Stavropol which was Gorbachev's um, homeland, and a Russian Chechen uh, from Grozny. And we got on that, and we got on to the conversation. I, I, I didn't tell him I was a general. 
all right? But I did tell him as an American diplomat in the embassy. And because um, um, you have to, in that society, be honest with them and that. If you try to be cute about what you are or whatever, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it's not smart. And so the Russians, from day one, uh, knew that um, I was declared uh, attache, intelligence officer, foreign area officer, and I had never had a problem. Um, but on this train, we, 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 were, uh, we were talking about um, um, the annexation of Crimea. And I tried to, in my, at my sort of so-so Russian, explain to them the eaches of why by law and everything else and United Nations, why, why uh, this was wrong. <laughs> and the plumber said, what? Nichevo. Это наш земля. Это наш народ. Meaning, what's the big deal? These, this is our land. This is our people. And I would submit that 60 to 80 percent of the Russians in that country believe it that way. Don't hurt my head with all the legalisms. We have, we have righted a indiscretion from 1954, full stop. Uh, and so they're all in, even including Gorbachev and others. I mean, they're, they're, they're on that. They think that the Crimea is, is back in the right place. Um, but that youth that I talk about, this isn't, this isn't the Russia of the Soviet Union. These guys are connected. Russia's number six or seven as far as IT in the world. And while, and while the, the youth are really, you know, uh, y y while they're linked, they, uh, they, 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 um, they right now are, are very, 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 uh, uh, very patriotic some very nationalistic, but as one veteran said to me, I, World War II veteran at Stalingrad, um, uh, I was, had the privilege of taking my son to Stalingrad, Volgograd last summer. Actually, we were there twice. And he said, I worry about my youth, our youth, Russian youth. They don't understand the horrors of war. This comes from a Stalingrad vet about his Russian youth. I, don't, I throw that out as a data point. Because uh, uh, the, uh, we, we would always kind of claim that the veterans and the, uh, and the um, communists are the most on board. And while they're certainly uh, supportive and patriotic, um, um, uh, the youth we have to watch. But it is the youth that will turn fastest if things, if, if eventually the, the, eventually the, the, the hypocrisy of the regime is exposed. I would submit that when uh, Yanukovych fell, and by the way, that's, that was the end of whatever we hoped was reset. I mean, it was already in life support. We had just gone through Magnitsky, and then right on top of it, this whole petulant thing on adoptions. I mean, how petulant was that? Um, um, and then the, you know, the Schneerson collection, and my neighbor was the US AID chief. You know, that's, you know, you know, civil society. Oh, you don't want that in Russia. NGOs. So even before, um, be, so, so, it, so it was already getting pretty lousy. Um, uh, and when Yanukovych flees, um, it's dead. Um, and it morphs into a ugly, ugly, as I said, type of nationalism. Um, but they had a lot of support. Uh, I would submit that when, uh, when Yanukovych fell and the corruption vomited out, that he saw himself in the mirror and, ba and freaked. And, um, and, and that, from that moment on, dip diplomatically, militarily, regionally, they went postal. And, and, and um, they, may have had, they may have had notions or ideas or desires to, to take down these places. Uh, but but it, it, I have to believe the, the Yanukovych thing was, 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 was a really, really bad thing for the uh, uh, Putin cabal. Since then, I agree with the uh, uh, Wall Street Journal article that you read, uh, I think six, 10 days ago, where he was doing a lot of improvisation and making it up as he goes. I don't like talking about leadership in, um, in, by uh, individuals. I don't. Um, um, but clearly, uh, he is the dominant guy. Um, 
decision making um, uh, is, is, is short and um, 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 clever. He is smart. Um, I think in his own mind, he's he's sort of a you know a, you know a, a, a new age czar, and, and and he also believes that he's indispensable. And bad things happen when you, as a leader, start to think that you're indispensable. Um, so so we'll see. I think they'll gerrymander the election again. Um, uh, what two years from now? Um, and he'll probably be uh, with us for another eight years as a minimum. Uh, so. Existential threat number one to uh, the Putin regime, and the um, um, you know I ask youth usually, and it's kind of the lead question. Usually they'll say NATO. What do they think NATO? I would submit is some, and you see it in their utterances, is some type of um, uh, color revolution regime. Now we're not in that business. We don't want to be in that business. We want the forces in Russia to go and go its own natural way. We don't want anything to do with um, that type of internal because it is, um, it is incendiary. Uh, but this is a obsession of the Russians and it shows their insecurity. Um, three major Russian calculations that, have, that are gonna wear them down and probably now a fourth. And the first one, they somehow managed to get the European Union mad at them. That was a pretty big feat. All right, now it's imperfect, but um, they, uh, the EU, um, um, I mean, in mostly are on board. And I think that, that once again, um, uh, Putin is part, I mean, at a certain point, um, the Germans and the French are just gonna say no mas. I mean, it's, 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 it's extraordinary. Um, the, um, they have managed I think this is a strategic miscalculation. <coughs> they have managed to coalesce, in my mind anyway, some sense of midstream, mainstream Ukrainian patriotism that is now beyond the nationalist parties that, that, take, that encompass the majority. And now you have 30 million Ukrainians, plus or minus, that while not necessarily completely anti-Russian, they're pro-Ukrainian. And that is something I think that we didn't bank on. And while it's been ugly and it's been, um, um, uh, and the Ukrainians have been fighting. And, and, uh, and, and, uh, and the soldiers do have the uh, mostly governmental support. Um, that was not part, um, I mean, they, the Russians really, really have alienated the uh, Ukrainian mainstream. And that whole Ukrainian piece is so complicated and so, I was against the provision of uh, additional defensive arms to Ukraine in the beginning of all of this, eight to, ten, eight to six to eight months ago. I've rolled, I support it now, I support it now. The Russians have deserved the reaction. The separatists have deserved the reaction, and the, uh, and the Ukrainians uh, need to be able to uh, fight on a more common field. And when you're dealing with defensive weapons, if you don't attack them, then they're not going to be killing you. Defensive weapons. Um, and I support the sanctions. And the sanctions have been a, a, a tool that we all looked in the beginning as being, um, being uh, weak. Um, but when you line them up with the uh, oil the collapse of the oil prices was not due to the sanctions and other things, this gets at the bottom line. A lot of the Russian elite, the, uh, the uh, Solovki, the, the inner circle around Putin, the oligarchs and the moneyed interests, the power vertical, I mean, they're, national, they're patriots, but they're also about the bottom line. And they can't be happy that, that Russia ec economically, I mean, they're losing billions of their, of, of their own assets. Um, they're, they're beginning to get constrained in their own ability to travel and visas. And, and they, they want to travel to their apartments in Grosvenor Square, London, and have their yachts down there. They don't want, they're patriots, but, but I don't think they want, you know, 
I, I, I want to believe that they're trying to give Putin uh, advice, which I imagine is pretty hard. So, um, um, so, so they have that going. Then the third one is, is that they were able to reaffirm kind of a searching purpose for NATO. <coughs> NATO now, Article 5 has been reinvigorated. It is complicated. It's really, really complicated. And where unfortunately, I think we're one of these do loops back and forth, that the more the Russians push, the more NATO is going to build up capabilities to defend, and then the Russians will build their capability. We get into some really nasty spiral. Um, um, so that wasn't part of their plan, too. I mean, the beginning of all this, NATO was, most of its meetings were still focused on Afghanistan and other things. Um, and um, uh, Putin better not test uh, Article 5 in the Baltics. Um, because I, I think somewhere a, a line will have to be drawn, which leads us to hybrid warfare. We've been reading about all the Russian doctrinal hybrid warfare stuff. I would submit that hybrid warfare is a kind of almost a, a um, first of all, it's understanding international law really well, and believe it or not, figuring out the seams, it's also recognition of your own vulnerabilities, uh, because you've got to do things asymmetric. And asymmetry often is you, you find ways to take down a bigger foe. Um, and so we're just going to have to watch. I just hope that, that, that the Russians don't try to create adventures um, in the Balts or down in Transnistria. You, I mean, you all know the geography as well as I do. Um, um, but, but I don't think that was part of their plan to reinvigorate NATO. So that's three. EU, the Ukrainians, and NATO, and then the fourth is the absolute collapse of, of good chunks of their economy. If I'm in a hospital emergency room, there is, with all the various vital signs in my mind, there isn't a single vital sign that is going up in Russia, uh, whether it's uh, demographically, economically, politically. For God's sakes, they've got a freak show of allies. I mean, I mean in, the war, in the Soviet days, they at least had sort of kind of allies. They have no allies. And China is too smart, I would submit, to get pulled into this thing. Though I would submit the Chinese and Russian foreign policy in regard to each other is pragmatic and smart. Neither of them want any problems with each other. They've, they've got problems in other areas to deal with. Uh, so I, I believe it is actually uh, practical uh, foreign policy. But I don't think the Chinese want to get pulled into something uh, with the Russians. Um, generational, um, generational demographics and the, and the, and the, and the uh, geography, security geography is horrendous for Russia. This is a country of plus or minus 145 million people. I mean, we in the United <coughs> States are two and a half thousand, two and a half times larger. Uh, this is a country, I mean, they've, 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 they've stopped the shrink rate, but they're basically flatlined. Um, uh, so they have the demographic thing that's very scary. They can't field a million-person military unless they really, really call reserves and things like that because of the demographics. And by the way, a lot of guys and gals don't want to serve. Um, I mean, go watch YouTube. So, so, um, and then there are there are mono there are mono petroleum state, you know, and eventually the the uh, pulling things down from the Arctic are going to get harder and harder. Um, and they've got really, really, really potentially bad borders. And one of the paradoxes about Afghanistan is certainly when I was there, we were getting, you know, a feel that the Russians don't want us to leave Afghanistan anymore. You remember when we went in originally? You know, they threw a fit. Because um, <coughs> uh, we, we were working Central Asia through the Partnership for Peace, which in my mind is the other great uh, one, uh, program um, cooperative threat reduction and, uh, and NATO's partnership for peace that really, really, I mean, th th there were some, that was, uh, that was, um, that was uh, Sekdef Perry, and that was sheer genius in bringing these Eastern European countries mostly out from the cold and then adding Central Asia to it. 
um, um, which actually set the uh, preconditions for when we came into Afghanistan after 9-11. Um, it was kind of already sort of uh, set up. Um, existential threats. I will only say that um, I think that the Russian Federation, I would say the Americans don't live in the world of thinking all the time about existential threats. I would submit large part due to their geography and their history. Um, <laughs> going back to the 1200s when Rus is put to the sword by the Mongols, which is probably the medieval equivalent of a thermonuclear bomb uh, when those people arrived. Um, um, I mean, the, the, Russia historically has been beleaguered. Um, and um, um, some of it because of their own if you will, aggressiveness, but just a, a large piece of it of their, uh, due to their uh, geography and probably demographics. So, from the east, you had the Mongols. You, uh, and while I am one, that, 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 come on, Boris, you know the West is no threat. NATO's is no threat. Nobody wants to fight with Russia. As, as, uh, you know, as, uh, as, as I mentioned uh, earlier today, you know, an old woman pulled me on the sleeve. We were having this discussion near Smolensk, and general remember that in, the li in my lifetime as a little girl, in the lifetime of my parents, Nazi jackboots were on the throats of our villages and towns for four years in most of European Russia, and 40, uh, 25 million of us, of us died. You know, and you just, you, you just want to hug them. You don't know what to say. You're, you're come utterly disarmed. And you're just, just, you know, you just, it's not that way today. And um, what I like to try to tell them, and in one reason it's not that way today, is because of NATO. Um, I like to ask Russians, the smart ones, do you really think Russian security would be better without NATO? And now you've got all these countries out there in Eastern Europe and the borderlands or the bloodlands are looking for alliances and groups and, and all that. Is that really good for Russia? Um, so I, I, I failed on the West. I, I was a little naive. I, I thought that I could get there and just talk to them about the West. The West is no threat. 1914 to 1954, plus or minus. World War One, Russian Revolution, Civil War, internally degener uh, 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 generated famines, repression, purges. Oh, by the way, the Second World War, and then the gulags until uh, Khrushchev uh, turned them off. Nobody knows the number. 40 million, plus or minus 5 million people? When you have a statistical deviation of 5 million people, that's pretty horrendous. Many of them civilians. So it's as if the whole country is in sort of a collective PTSD uh, from that era. And I would submit that plays into the way they see the world, their blinkered view of the West, because we don't understand it. We, we, we really, come on, stop, as I said. Um, your, your problems are going to be in the South, in the East. So we're going to have to keep working at it. It hasn't worked. Uh, the Russian military, I just say uh, I've met a lot of them. I say they're, uh, they're above average. Uh, their, their, their nuclear tip forces are really, really good. Their Spetsnaz, their airborne and guards units are really, really good. But their main average forces, remember the 30% of the troops every year are <coughs> drafted. And not necessarily pop, not, and it's not popular. So when you, and I'm a military guy, when you have to swap out a unit every, thir, uh, every year, bring in 30% new people every year, with dead off Sheena and the hazing and all of that, it creates a problem. I wouldn't want to commit one of those units into eastern Ukraine. Um, uh, because, because there would be contradictions, I would submit. Unhappy, unhappy kids and things like that saying, ah, not so sure. Remember, Afghanistan blew back on the Soviets eventually. It became very, very unpopular in that far more controlled society. Um, so so th 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 it's a very, very uh, capable military, um, but, but um, the, they have some major modernizations. And guess what? 
um, I would submit that this, this crash financially is going to slow down their modifications. But, um, you know, again, they don't want to go to war with the United States and NATO. I really believe that. However, however, uh, they will prepare for it. Um, implausible deniability. Um, it gets at, uh, we, 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 we've saw, seen, we're just even here in the States and Europe, just can't believe that the, the, the disinformation, the Moskorovka, the Sepsi, all of that, were not in eastern Ukraine. Trust me, sports fans, Russian main force units were in eastern Ukraine um, in, uh, in July. Okay? And, and, um, and they denied it, continued to deny it. Um, and, and, you know, in that sense, we're fed up. Um, but again, they don't want to tell their own people. That's unpopular, actually. I don't think that they want, you know, you've read about the Russian, Russians coming back, you know, people, soldiers that are coming back or being cremated because of accidents. And they're not telling their narod, their leader, their, their people that they were killed in combat in eastern Ukraine. So, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, and the whole implausible deniability thing, again, again, this, this is a regime that is in part about the bottom line, money. And if they, if they absolutely in full bloom show their, their cards in eastern Ukraine, meaning main force Russian units, then the sanctions come in even harder, and that's bad, okay? And, and unfortunately, it's the only tool, because nobody wants to go to war in Ukraine, including us. Uh, so the economic, the economic um, piece is, is, is very, very important, and the, whole, and, and the Russians know it, and which is why they, they in, in my mind, are, are uh, trying to avert that by not admitting it. Um, strategic messaging and bullying. Um, those, those reports of uh, Russian aircraft and ships and all of that, um, I think there's a, yes, they're testing their capability as a military man. Yes, it's dangerous. Uh, because they have capabilities, but the Russians also have ICBMs and they have nuclear-tipped submarines. So in that aspect of it, they could do it many different ways. I think that they're first and foremost messaging. I think that they're, they're blustering. Um, and I, 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 I think the way they've been doing it has been um, somewhat, uh, the, the, the thinking behind it is a little bit like being a bully. And um, in, it's unhelpful. Russian intimidation I st uh, and predatory actions in, 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 uh, on the borders of, 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 their, of their former, uh, um, of the former Soviet Union. All I know is that I stood in Kaliningrad at a major exercise, Zapad 13, and watched the Russian Baltic fleet erupt, boil out of the Black Baltic Sea in a counter-terrorist action and do a major naval landing to include a hovercraft from L that just disgorged, you know, uh, military equipment and people. Now, how do you think the Balts and the Poles feel about that? I mean, I mean, it is there's a there's a there's a level of intimidation. Uh, we don't want the Balts and that pole and all that to be more tense, but those countries need some reassurance. They need some reassurance. They feel. They are out there by themselves. They remember 39, okay? And um, it's, it's, uh, it's troubling. Um, so I believe they have earned, the Russians have earned, and this is what I would tell them, the reaction of def clearly defensive forces, that, uh, little forces that go in there to, to buttress, if you will, our allies, as any ally would do. Um, I've talked about uh, China. Again, I believe that their, their politics are utterly transactional. We should have things in common. Extremist Sunni Islam. I mean, I mean, there are so many things in my mind that we have shared interest with Russia that we got to find a way to get through this period uh, without confrontation or brinksmanship. Um, so, so um, I, I, I could go on and on, but I think I'm going to stop. Um, um, I think we have to be firm. We should try to dialogue with Russia every way we can. Um, listen to them. They will say we don't listen well enough. 
Uh, we need to build up, as you're doing here in Watson in an undergrad, we need to build up our, 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 our young Russian, soon to be Russian experts, because throughout the government of not just the United States, but in the West and all that, since uh, the Middle East is blown, uh, uh, the whole Russian expertise side has been has, has substantially uh, fallen. So, finally, um, I shy away from the term Cold War with Russia. There are there are certainly aspects of behaviors, mostly Russian, that are Sovietish, if you will. Um, and a reminiscent of the Cold War. I worry for all the reasons we talked about. I think if we start talking about the Russians in term, terms of Cold War, we're, our, we're building a self-fulfilling prophecy. And I think we have to be very, very careful uh, in the words. Words matter. That's why I go crazy when the Hill um, um, when, uh, we were there when, when Kerry, uh, not Kerry, it was uh, Romney, and I, and, I, and I made political, it's not, it called the Russians foes in 2012, and we're all in the embassy going, oh, this has just got a whole lot harder. And they just, you know, words matter. We have to be patient, we have to be assiduous, we have to be firm, we have to push back where our interests are, and we have to avoid brinksmanship. And hopefully we can get out of this really, really nasty spell and Russia can kind of regain, if you will, uh, re-enter, if you will, the mainstream um, um, uh, global uh, law-abiding uh, community. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll open it up for questions now. Yeah. Lyle. He's an old friend 11 years ago. Uh, that was really a brilliant talk, many, many insights. Uh, let me um, maybe push a little bit on two points. Uh, I'm a little surprised you did not mention at all uh, the process of NATO expansion. Maybe I, I stepped out for a minute, but um, this was ongoing in the 90s. You know, a lot of people viewed it as kind of, kind of uh, as it were, overstepping, you know, the, uh, uh, what would be a kind of, uh, as it were, a, a Piece that that Russians would not find, you know, as it were, offensive or threatening. So that's one point. The other, so you know, is there some? Yeah, we can talk is, about Is that. there some room for soul searching on that point? Sure. Uh, the other question, and this is more of a current policy question, is regarding arms, giving arms to the uh, Ukrainians. And my, a lot of people have said, well, you know, if we do that, it could cause a lot of trouble because Russia has a kind of uh, Escalation dominance. That is, any any uh, chips we put in, they they have the, let's say, the will and the capability to push more chips in. So, is is that not a losing game? Let's start with that question. We'll go back to NATO. You're right. You're right. Um, saying that um, Ukraine um, is in a basically fight for its life. Um, uh, they're not well equipped to deal with these separatists where they're being heavily equipped by the Russians and supported by the Russians. And um, I would prefer that any, um, any um, addition of defensive capabilities was multinational and not U.S.-led. But I, 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 you know, Ukraine suffers from being outside of an alliance system. And, you know, it's the classic borderlands, bloodlands. Um, which brings me to your second point. Yes, I think that there was an air of triumphalism in the 90s. Um, um, and, and we may have steamrolled the Russians on certain aspects of NATO enlargement. But at the same point, you know, through the Partnership for Peace, how do you say no to nations that show a civilian military, uh, civil military, civil control of the military, do the right, do the right um, 
things to make themselves NATO uh, eligible, and they have, they're desperate to be part of an alliance system. I, I only say, could you imagine this part of the world today if a lot of those countries weren't in NATO? I mean, a, a, a potential arc of instability in there, of uh, alts. And so it is a great question. It is a great question. Um, uh, I also think, and I remind the Russians, that NATO, yes, NATO was, was a Cold War response to the Russians first and foremost. But there was another very important aspect of NATO, too. And that mattered even after the 90s, when, every, after, uh, when everything changed in Europe, is that it's not since Cyprus in the 70s have NATO countries fought each other. And so NATO, his, his first it was defensive, and then we thought peace had broken out of the world. We, we kind of, and we tried to bring Russia in with the NATO Founding Act and other things. And, and for a while, it was kind of working. I mean, Russia is a member of NATO's Partnership for Peace. But somewhere it started to spin out. Maybe it was Chechnya, maybe it was some other, the Balkans, Kosovo, um, um, and, you know. And so we, we lost the bubble on it. Um, so, and the Russians are, will say, and I think they believe it. Uh, but our politicians were, were there saying, we never promised. Russians said they did. I, I don't think we. It, it, I don't think it's written anywhere, but uh, the Russians said you basically reneged um, first in uh, militarizing East Germany, um, and then and then and so on. NATO, in my mind, is the core international security equity for the United States and a number of, of the NATO allies. There's some NATO allies probably today that kind of wish they weren't in NATO. <laughs> you know, so it, it, it's really, really complicated. But um, I, we are, it's very, very difficult now because of the Baltics and, and, and Poland. And, 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 and if ever a country was worthy to be in NATO, it was Poland. And I always believed that Poland was really the first main reason um, uh, of a NATO enlargement. Another country traditionally caught in between, a battleground, a buffer zone. So, so I, while I'm trying, I can't, I, you're right. There, there may have been a mis, there may, we may not have done a very, very good job uh, communicating it, um, but these were, these were worthy countries, um, and they're good allies, and they, uh, they helped in Afghanistan and other places. But now we're in this pretty difficult space. And the last thing, I tell the Russians, look at NATO. Come on. You know NATO's no threat to you conventionally. We're not talking about thermal. I'm hearing it's got 18,000 soldiers. All of the Baltics are 10. You know, nobody's a threat to you. Stop it. You know? Um, <coughs> it's hard. Please, Matt. Ma well, thank you for very thought-provoking talk. If I were capable, I'd duck under my desk. <laughs> but, but I have a pessimistic and an optimistic uh, question uh, to follow through with the arming of the uh, Ukrainians. Uh, and admittedly, at least you admitted, that might prove to be an escalation of arms. And if you are also sanctioning sanctions, uh, and yet you advise us not to push Russia over the edge. Now, if those combined factors might not put them over the edge, what do you think will the, the, the situation we're supposed to avoid? I think what could put Russia over the edge is because of its own internal contradictions. I use the term, they start boiling in the oil, in the oil of their own creation. Okay. And <laughs> they start looking over their shoulder at the narod, at the people. And they, you know, Putin is looking at the oligarchs. He doesn't trust them as much anymore. Oligarchs are looking at the people. Um, uh, sustained sanctions. <laughs> we don't want. We don't want that for Russia. Um, 
there's a, a young lad that I know um, who th there is what we call that teenagers talk to each other on um, on Skype American teenagers British teenagers Russians and um, um, and in one Russian girl friend was talking to him and they're friends and and she said um, talked about she was scared because they are they're, the shelves were getting bare again in places. Their parents were stockpiling, couldn't find luxury items anymore, or fewer luxury items. Why are the Americans doing this to us? Um, um, and I, I think that we just have to be patient, try to not get caught into anything confrontational, and got to find a way to get them to stop. Because they are involved in aggression in eastern Ukraine. There's no way. And why sh should we be involved? In no, we don't want to be involved. In it. We, want, we, we don't want to be involved. But, but it's, 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 it's international law. We kind of lead, lead, lead. We're not perfect. But we kind of lead, lead with other countries on that. Um, and um, I mean, not since the end of the Second World War and the Cold War, has there been a conflict of this type in, that involves irredentism, which is a very, very malignant thing. Uh, the Balkans was something different, but that was all internal and was very ugly. But this is actual aggression, cross-border aggression. So, so to, to, to get at the root of the question, how to I think that I think that <coughs> the Russians quietly, the leadership, have to be pretty worried right now. It's not going so well for them. Look at the, the optimistic briefly. Uh, I agree that we have to uh, talk to them. That was I agree. the whole point of, uh, of many uh, prior attempts at detente and so on. But what points of entry do you suggest that since the military seems to be a flaw? Well, I'm one that advocates that we need to talk to the military at the operational level and rebuild links with them. And it, it, even if we have to we agree to disagree, because you can, you can still agree to disagree and trust each other on a more primal level. It's what I call the, the vodka to vodka level, eye to eye level. Uh, you you descend below the talking points. <laughs> you understand exactly what I'm saying. We don't have that right now. We've lost that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it seems that in many ways Putin holds all the trump cards, be it military or economic, and the, with regards to the future of Ukraine. And he can un destabilize it in, a, in any number of forms. And it, we're not sure whether he wants a land bridge to Transdenister. That's the maximalist agenda. The more likely thing is he wants a, a paral paralyzed and, and potentially failed state in Ukraine and will keep poking at it for as long as it's there. But in sort of putting our foot down, the, the, the military option seems to be extremely dangerous as we all seem to agree, but nobody seems to be saying, you know, look, the, the way to signal that this can't go forward is by investing he heavily in the creation of a viable Ukrainian nation state. I mean, in some perverse way, yeah. Putin has succeeded in creating a Ukrainian nation, and now we don't know whether this is going to be a viable nation state. It <coughs> may be that the only way to do that is to harm it, but uh, that's certainly in not sufficient at this point. And yet, there's very little discussion either in the European arena or the American policy arena of the kind of massive investment that it would take to do that. Is there any chance of that appearing on the horizon? Uh, As the answer is, I don't know. Um, uh, <coughs> It's a little bit better. I think in the last two months there have been larger credits that have been um, granted to Ukraine, but I do believe that all of us um, have uh, financially not gone all in on, uh, on some type of new age, I don't want to say Marshall Plan, 
um, um, for Ukraine. Um, the, um, I, I, I often thought that the best way to secure the, the Russian areas of eastern Ukraine that aren't under uh, occupation or of the, uh, of the separatists is just pour money and development into those places. Um, um, but I think that it, it, part, part of the problem in Ukraine, of course, is that they're also still uh, uh, very, very corrupt. And, and you, know, you know, probably 30% of your dollar is going to go into a pocket, and people can't countenance that. But I think that we have all been, we have not gone all in financially to, uh, to um, uh, build the economy and civil society. Uh, economy is depressed in Europe, um, uh, but it's a key piece. I mean, I would go, I mean, if you compare the response of the West to providing support to Ukraine <laughs> in development or technical assistance across any domain. And what, now what was going on in, in, in Poland in, in the late, early, in the early 90s, it's a joke. I mean, there's, there are no Marriott brigades in, in Kiev, right? There are more Chinese in the hotels looking to <coughs> lease land than there are uh, Western, you know. Yeah. It's, it's pretty pathetic that way. Yeah, the, the economics um, are critical. Short of existential go-to-war <coughs> moments, it's always starts and ends with economy. Um, and uh, this part, um, um, uh, we're not there. I mean, there's been a lot thrown in, but <coughs> We're not there. Are there are questions from, from any of our students in particular? We, we always try yes. to privilege students. You're welcome to. But in, in the interim, I'll ask a question. Please. Then. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Um, so given the current momentum and uh, the situation in the Baltics, uh, being from Baltic region, I'm very curious about your perspective. What is the level of threat the Russia is posing to the entire uh, to Baltic countries, and if so, how big would you uh, uh, speculate? Where are you from? Which country? Latvia. Latvia. Okay, up north. Right in the middle. Yeah. Because um, there, there's a threat. There's a threat, and I want to believe that Article Five is going to um, make the consequences of an adventure in. Um, the Baltics uh, too high a cost for Russia. Uh, clearly there's a threat. Uh, I mean, militarily, as good as your forces are, they could be in Tallinn in 24 hours. Because uh, there has been, uh, I've been following a lot of what's going on back home, and uh, I know there has been a, some military movement near our uh, eastern border, and there has been uh, some advanced military equipment deployed in form of a, uh, air force that can reach any part of our country within hours, and we don't have any defensive systems to protect ourselves or even to detect them because they're flying below the radar. And uh, also, I don't know, can we expect much protection, uh, quote unquote, from NATO? I know there we are a part of uh, of the of the NATO force, but I think that. Um, I think NATO takes it seriously. I know the United States does. Um, um, uh, we've had these Atlantic Resolve exercises. Basically, they have um, as a show of not force, because this is not a big force, but as a show, um, uh, just a demonstration, just showing the Russians just back off. Um, there were, you know, tanks that were actually uh, that, uh, in in. Uh, in the Baltics as part of this uh, Atlantic Resolve exercise. And the Russians squawked about it. But again, the line is, is guys, you earned this reaction. These guys are our allies. You know that these guys have no capability to invade you. Stop it. <coughs> you know? and, and sometimes you have to talk to them directly. And, uh, I also, I'm fearing. Uh from this uh, former Soviet Union countries, we still have a lot of Russian population. Right. So, 
Uh, I think another worry is not about invasion, but demolition from within. Because there has been, uh, I've noticed within our uh, Baltic states an increasing number of uh, ethnically Russian politicians who are directly linked to actual Russian uh, Federation. And, and I think that some, uh, I've read that, uh, that some of the Russian uh, minority are being issued passports from Russia. Yes. Um, it's the enclaves are of concern, um, um, especially up by Narva in your country. Um, and down Narva by Estonia. Uh, part, Narva and, uh, would be in Estonia. Yeah. And, and um, uh, in the area, in the, in the border regions, um, you have a Russian, um, you have a, a, a uh, so it's, it, it, I'm sorry, it's, it's Riga. Riga. Riga is a large, large Russian population, and dug off kills in that area as well. Yeah. The, um, I, what I want to believe is that, that the Russian youth, I mean, life, I think, in, in these countries, even there are those that would say that while the Russians aren't abused in your countries, that, that, that the societies are not fully inclusive to the Russians. The gap is increasing. And, and that is a problem. But I'm not, I'm not, not going to get involved in your internal politics. But I would submit that the, the way to firm up those Russian minorities is to have completely inclusive, um, 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 if you will, um, politics uh, for that or, or, or life for them. Um, it's tricky, but that's 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 what everybody's worried about. Um, I would also, um, um, frankly, I would televise massively um, the scenes of destruction in eastern Ukraine into these enclaves who watch a lot of Russian TV and say, "You don't want to do this. You don't want your enclaves to look like this." You know, uh, and then finally, even. Even, um, and, and what I'm hearing anecdotally, that even with issues of not full equalities, that life in those enclaves is a whole lot better than life across the border in Russia. <laughs> you know, so, so I don't know. I, I don't think, I don't know. I'm not, I'm, I don't know if, if, if something, the little green men showed up in, in these places, if um, if they're going to get complete support of the Russians, even, and, and a lot of that is going to be how how your governments work this thing, and again how OSCE, NATO, EU uh, uh, work it. It's complicated, but yes, it is a threat. I think we have time for one more question. I think Professor Keith Brown, please. So I just uh, want to follow on Professor Halley's some of her. Uh, Positioning. It's a very provocative talk, and you used the f you, and you said words matter, which I really appreciate. And you also spoke about the importance of cultural expertise, understanding, and empathy. Um, I mean, I wonder if one of the pathways. And I'm, well, so, so there's two parts to this question. One is the degree to which some of the words that you've used, petulance, um, the misinformation of the middle of the country, um, a kind of erratic elite. Um, leadership, if there are ways that a Russian scholar might be talking to a, a Russian audience right now and making similar claims about the U.S. and its conduct in recent years. And that sort of goes with, the, with your, your, your reiteration of the Russians have earned the response they're getting. Um, to what, so I'd sort of ask you to reflect on the degree to which U.S. foreign policy, especially in the years after 2001, have earned the responses that it's getting. And then the second one is, the second part of the question is, you alluded to yourself, you're curious about where this, where and when this turn took place in Russian policy, where, if you like, Russia decided to opt out or punish the peace and so on. And you mentioned there's two possibilities, Chechnya and Kosovo. Um, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of the ways that we're hearing about Russia, Ukraine, which are, are scaled up Serbia, Bosnia. I and mean, I know you said Bosnia was internal to Yugoslavia, but it wasn't at the time that a lot of this, the, the fighting took place. Bosnia had been recognized as a separate state. So it did become an international issue. And a lot of the absurd denial, 
the, 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 the implausible denials by Milosevic, um, and, and then a sort of different kind of slow-paced response on the part of different Western actors, uh, culminating, as Tony said, in a fairly substantial investment in trying to turn this back. But so do you, do you see this as, do you see, I mean, if we can imagine for a moment that there's something sort of strategic going on on the Russian side, um, to what extent is, is a kind of American obliviousness to the results of American policy something that he's able to leverage? Um, what, and, I mean, and then, and then the, I guess the last question is, given that you've, you've, you've emphasized that the dropping oil price is part of what's putting Russia in this pickle, so to speak, um, where do you think that drop in oil price is coming from? Do you see that as a natural economic adjustment or as probably Russians suspect and probably most analysts would say, there is politics in a falling price as well as politics in an escalating price. So if no one wants Russia to fail, how is it that the oil price is dropping if it's so central to what's going on? Let me answer the last. First of all, I, I don't know. Um, I would submit that it is uh, that there are market forces in play, but of course the Saudis and all that, they, they probably have you know, whether it's, uh, you know, sticking it to the Russians who also, uh, the Saudis um, are, are anti-Assad. Uh, there might be that aspect of it. Um, um, you know, we've heard that, you know, that the, the Saudis may actually also um, want to um, diminish our fracking in the United States. So, so it's a, it's, I wouldn't say it is a Russia thing. But it is a it is a, a economic move that, that could put a number of countries and places in uh, um, in some stress. I, I think that with Russia not wanting it to fail, and then we talked about gas prices. This is the the monies that they you know what is it? I mean, the monies in part that that they get from $100 a barrel is expressly for the modernization of their military. And while I don't like my friends in Russia suffering through all this, in the big picture, again, uh, they've kind of, you know, they've kind of, you know, put a fire to their own house, if you will. And I don't think that the, um, uh, so the, the oil thing was just just a whole other aspect to a falling ruble, as 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 as, as, uh, as you know, and and, and um, so so go back, uh, uh, come back to me with your first question and just a simple question. Well, so, sorry, so, yeah. Well, I, I, so that you you reiterated this phrase, they've earned what they're getting, and I just. I, I'm, I'm curious if you would reflect that back on yeah. the U.S. foreign policy. Yeah. The denial um, of foreign there, deployment and such. I would submit that um, I don't think we've always been right. Uh, we may have misjudged some things. I don't know if um, we, and this is why for with students like yourself are so important, because understanding the Russians um, or trying to understand the Russians and the history and it is, it is very, very important. Um, um, I think that, you know, the whole aspect, there's an aspect, it's a visceral thing. I think the Russians are acting, acting quite viscerally. Um, um, I think that they feel that in the, in the, in the grand scheme, certainly back since, uh, uh, since the 90s, that uh, whatever notion of Russian honor, they have their own peculiar honor codes. Uh, has been impinged, um, and that basically any time they try to do something with NATO or the West, they get the short end of it. I think there's a side of that that they feel, um, uh, but I think that the all of that is more complex as I'm laying out. Um, so um, I think we've talked past each other sometimes. Uh, Russia. If you watch the news in Russia, and you, those who've been in Russia, every, oh, seemingly almost every paragraph 
on the news, you'll hear Sasha, USA. I mean, they are absolutely, I, I don't want to, it is so much a part of their reporting, whether it's bad or good, they pay far more attention to us than, frankly, our heartland pays to them. And, 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 and I do say that they've earned reactions. Um, because I try to, you know, you know, just, Ivan, you know, if you would just stop these, these um, exercises around the Balts, then NATO would not feel compelled to show their allies resolve. You earned that reaction. What are we going to do? Just allow them to intimidate them? And, and I don't like it because I understand the ramifications of it. I would like Russia to be an ally or, or a partner because I'm of the belief, I mean, I sound like a, a blazing coal warrior. I fundamentally like the Russians. I find the government reprehensible. I fundamentally like the Russians. I worry that they're headed into a cul-de-sac. And I worry they're going to bring a whole bunch of countries into the cul-de-sac with them. And, and I believe that it is actually, not ISIS, our number one foreign policy concern. Because by extension, it could become existential. We never want to go there, ever. So we need to be talking. We need to be engaging. Words matter. We've got to maybe sharpen our own dialogue and narrative. Um, um, what's happened has happened. You know, I mean, you know, we can, we can do some introspection, um, uh, but if we can take that introspection and then parlay it into a fresher view on how we engage with the Russians, but it's done now. Yeah, and and, and, and um, we are where we are right now. So it's, it's a great question, thought-provoking. I don't think I answered it anywhere nearly the way you wanted me to. Um, 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 this is a, a this is a a, a strategic strategic relationship that we have to get more right than wrong, and and because it is potentially existential, with all that comes with that. Um, okay, thank you. <laughs>